Customs 101 webinar looking at the need for declarations, how free trade agreements and customs unions differ and work, and the implications of Brexit. My name is William Barnes Graham and I will be on hand to facilitate any questions or queries you may have during this webinar. You can use the control panel to the right hand side of your screen to ask any questions and send in comments at any point. Next please. The UK Customs Academy has been set up by KGH Customs Services and the Institute of Export and International Trade at the request of HM, HMRC to enable individuals and businesses to gain the knowledge and skills around international customs that will be essential for trade in the years to come. The Academy is evolving to become an essential resource for industry professionals that not only offers leading edge training and, uh, and education, but also a unique range of individual and business membership benefits to support the profession providing invaluable business resources, advice on industry best practice, and a virtual community for industry professionals. Before we begin today's main presentation, we're going to be running a few straw polls today, beginning with the first question, which I'm launching now. And this question asks, during this period of social distancing, how much time have you dedicated to online training each week? The options are 10 plus hours, six to 10 hours, one to five hours or, uh, or zero or zero to one. Um, I'll leave that open for a few seconds for people to answer. Um, appreciate not everyone's always able to answer using the GoToWebinar system, but uh, hopefully most people will be able to click on one of those checkboxes. And at this point, I will, while letting you answer, I introduce you to today's speaker, who is Steve Cock from the Academy and also KGH Custom Services. Hi, Steve. Hi. And thanks very much. So, so, um, so I'm just going to close the poll and share the findings. So that's quite a lot have done a little bit of 65% saying one to five, and there's a few of you out there who have done even more. But uh, at this point, I'll hand over to you, Steve. Thanks very much. <clears throat> so as, as Will indicated, um, uh, I'm currently Director of Consultancy for KGH Custom Services uh, and KGH is one of the partners who uh, set up and maintain the Customs Academy on behalf of uh, UK government. Um, formerly, I started off my working life as a customs officer in the UK and I've been providing uh, consultant, uh, consulting to industry for about the last 20 or so years. So in this uh, webinar, we're going to almost go back to basics and look at why uh, declarations are required, what goes into the, those declarations and what the implications may be um, as a result of the move to formally leaving the European Union at the end of the year. So as we're going back to basics, the first question is why have customs duty? Uh, and the answer simply is to protect the home market uh, within the country or the territory uh, to ensure that uh, manufacturing can survive against competition, that agriculture uh, can uh, maintain its place. And so that the market, uh, the home market doesn't potentially become uh, flooded with uh, imports from outside the territory. The other reason, of course, is taxation. Uh, so governments, are, one of the, the oldest forms of taxation is customs duty, and governments and trading blocks uh, collect customs duty uh, as one of their means of funding themselves. Generally, it's based on the value of the goods that are imported. However, sometimes, particularly in the agricultural sector, it can be based on the weight of the product. Uh, and a very good example is something like sugar. It's a very protective measure within the European Union, but the uh, rate of duty on sugar is 419 euros per tonne at the moment. Um, and bearing in mind that world sugar price is 366 euros per tonne, uh, that gives an indication of how protective the European Union can be. Um, Duty can also be based on the number of units, watches, for instance, it, it's based that way. Um, but you also get things like anti-dumping duty. So if you get a, uh, a supplier from outside the territory that is trying to corner the market in something, for instance, recently uh, there were uh, Chinese solar panels being produced very, very cheaply uh, and were being brought in and 
the market effectively was being flooded by them uh, at a reduced price, then the uh, territory or the country can apply to the World Customs Organization for an anti-dumping measure. And that's a, a rather t punitive rate of duty that would be applied to those goods. Uh, you also have, in the case of the UK, you have the national tax of VAT uh, that is also applied. So customs duty goes to the European Union as we're a member state, but VAT is collected and retained by the UK. Again, based on value, normally 20%, but there are exceptions. So the other reason we have uh, the need for declarations and, and borders is to control the goods that enter a country. Now, at the moment, there's a lot of talk between what's happening between the UK and the EU as far as uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is concerned. And that tends to be around uh, conformity in uh, electrical goods. Uh, uh, we've all heard of uh, uh, chlorinated chicken, uh, the, the quality of the slaughtering that takes place um, outside of the European Union is also brought into question. So there is control on goods and that's exercised at the borders as well. So particularly firearms, military equipment, drugs, uh, animals, food checks, that kind of thing. Also artwork, um, expensive artwork cannot be removed uh, from the community without a, an export license. <clears throat> so what is a customs union? Uh, a customs union is effectively a collection of countries that all behave together uh, as, a, uh, as a union uh, for customs purposes. So if you bring goods into the European Union and you pay duty on them when they enter, you can then freely move them around the European Union without need for further declarations and without the need for additional customs duty to be paid. Um, as you can see in this picture, the UK is highlighted uh, as a country that is leaving the European Union at the moment, uh, and Turkey is an accessionary member to the European Union. It's been that for a long time, so it's not a formal member, but if you import uh, goods into Turkey and pay the duty on it, then effectively it, it is within the community. You do not have to uh, pay tax again as it crosses into the European Union from Turkey, however, a customs declaration is required. And in the same way, when we leave the European Union, a customs declaration will be required for goods coming and going. Uh, now, the European Union isn't the only uh, customs union within the world. Uh, there are a good number of them. Uh, as you can see in, in this picture, most are based in Africa or, or South America, uh, and they operate in, in much the same way you will have a arrangement where not only can goods move freely, but services, uh, and there will be uh, conformity in terms of um, food standards, electrical standards, all sorts of different things. Of course, that will be bound up within the, uh, the actual agreement that the parties to that arrangement have signed. So those are customs unions. It's where uh, taxation is controlled uh, centrally for customs duty. Conversely, you also have free trade agreements. Um, now, under these, you have separate trading blocks that have agreed to trade with each other under uh, unified terms. And so whenever goods move from uh, a supplier, so take the European Union's free trade agreement with Japan, when goods leave Japan, there will still be an export document. And as they enter the European Union, wherever that happens to be, there'll be an import document. Uh, but at that point, there will be the chance for the goods that are being imported to benefit from a reduced rate of duty. It wouldn't necessarily be all encompassing that all goods were covered by that arrangement, but generally you'll find that most are, agriculture is often missed off. But if you can demonstrate that the goods that you're importing, in this case from Japan, originated in Japan, so they can't be manufactured in China, shipped to Japan and then brought into the European Union that way. If they originated in Japan, then they would be able to be entered to the European Union, potentially at a reduced rate of duty. But on demand, you would have to be able to prove the origin of those goods. Uh, also under a free trade agreement, it may be that it's extended to include goods and services. Uh, and all sorts of other factors can be included within it. And, and the free trade agreement that the UK government are seeking to agree at the moment with the European Union 
isn't so dependent on the fact that we're looking for free trade in terms of goods. It's being held up by all sorts of other factors on services and on things like fishing quota. Um, but a free trade agreement can include a great deal that is included within a customs union. The decisive points are, though, that you remain separate entities and declarations are required. So turning to declarations, uh, for a lot of companies, they will be very familiar with these. They will have been trading with uh, countries outside the European Union. But for a good number of others where their trade is limited to the member states of the European Union, there will have never been a requirement for them to produce import or export declarations. So what are they? Um, effectively, they're a means to allow for the control of the goods that enter the territory. Uh, they allow the territory to collect tax. I use the term territory because, of course, it can be a country or it can be a customs union. Um, it allows them to, to collect tax on those goods. Uh, if it's something that's being imported temporarily and then re-exported, it may be that they'll take security to ensure that those goods are going to be eventually re-exported. Uh, but it also allows the importer to state their intentions with regard to those goods to the authorities. For instance, I am going to import these, I am going to process them, and then I'm going to re-export them. So please don't charge me customs duty uh, because I'll eventually prove that they've gone. There are also other things that declarations will tell you. They will tell you whether or not the goods are subject to license and what the, if they are, what the license uh, number is, things like that. So when making a customs declaration, uh, for, for those individuals and companies that haven't had to deal with this before, there's a lot of data that you have to get into them. And that's why brokers are required. They're experienced in pulling this information together. I'll gloss over this fairly quickly, but for instance, you, you, you have to have, whether it's an import or an export, the declaration itself, you have to have who the consigner was, was who sent the goods, who the importer is, their declarant or representative who's actually doing the paperwork for them, the classification of the goods, we'll come on to that in a minute, the origin of the goods, where it's come from, and again, we'll come on to that, um, the, the preference, whether you're entitled to a reduced rate of duty under a free trade agreement, and the customs procedure code that tells the authorities what you're going to do with the goods. In terms of representation, there are two types. There's direct representation. So if you employ a broker to act on your behalf to clear your goods for you, as a direct representative, they just act on your behalf without liability. They just fill out the paperwork for you, submit it to customs, and that's it. An indirect representative will complete the paperwork, but they're equally liable for the amount of duty or VAT that the, the principal, the importer, is, is liable to pay. Why do you get the difference? Because if you have somebody who's with, not uh, a resident of the country of importation, they cannot import in their own name because at the end of the day, if there's a bill to pay, the authorities have to have somewhere where they can go to charge that money. So often agents are required to act as indirect representatives for their clients, but it's something that they're reticent to do. So post Brexit, this will be quite a big thing. If you export from the UK, you're resident here, not a problem. If you're importing into France, Germany or elsewhere and you do not have a legal entity there, you will potentially have to find yourself an indirect representative and they won't necessarily be queuing up to take that particular work. Other data elements, um, I mentioned customs procedure code. This is a seven digit code that tells customs what you're going to do with the goods. I won't dwell on this, but it breaks down into a number of sections. There's the first pair says what's happening now, the second pair what happened before, and the third three digits just allow for national coding to break down effectively the first code into a number of subsectors. So if you're doing a standard import, the first two digits will always be 40 and a standard export will always be 10. It just basically tells customs what you're doing. <clears throat> Some further information that, that the customs require, the, and these are things that you have to provide to your import agent if you're going to make declarations on imports and exports. So the mass of the goods, the item price, we'll move on to valuation in a minute. Additional information. So are there certificates of authorization that you've got from customs to import those goods? Is it a drug precursor, for instance? Did you need an approval for that? Do you have a phytosanity certificate because you're importing uh, foodstuffs? 
you also have to have a statistical value for the goods. And then based on that, the calculation of taxes take place. And there's also got to be the place and date of import. But as you can see, the final item is 54. So at the moment, there are potentially 54 data elements that might be required in a customs declaration. That's under the current import entry system called Chief, which is going to be replaced at some point by, by uh, HMRC. And at that point, the data set's going to get bigger. But it shows the kind of information that brokers have to deal with and that importers, exporters, if they aren't already used to dealing with, will have to deal with it in the future. So I'm going to hand you back to Will now for a second poll. Great, thank you. Thank you, Steve. So I'm just going to launch the second poll, which is, how prepared do you feel for changes to trade with the EU at the end of the transition period? And the options on a scale of very prepared to not at all prepared, and I'm not sure field there as well. Um, Steve, while letting people um, answer that poll, just a quick question in from Scott, who's asked, what customs paperwork implications will Brexit bring to the rules of origin for goods being exported? There will, there will be quite a lot of um, implications in terms of if you want to take advantage of a free trade agreement, uh, you're going to generally have to fill out paperwork uh, to go with those goods. You're going to have to be able to prove that the goods are of um, UK origin, and we'll come on to that in a second. But it's going to be a paperwork requirement as much as anything. Great, thank you, Steve. I'm just going to close that poll and show the results. Uh, encouragingly, 43% are quite prepared, 11% very prepared. So it's just about over um, over 50%, but 28% uh, saying not very prepared, 8% not at all prepared, so not too many there, and 10% not sure. Um, any thoughts on that, Steve, before I hand back over? Um, well, to be honest, it, it's not a great surprise. I mean, there are lots of ha um, household names that still haven't done a great deal of uh, Brexit preparation. Uh, I suppose to a certain extent you can understand it because it's always been the never-never, will it ever arrive? And of course, there's still that question now with the, the COVID virus, will Brexit formally take place at the end of the year? Great, We're assured. Uh... Way back. <laughs> great, back to you, Steve. No, you keep going. Uh, I'm done. I'm done. That's uh, that's all for me. Okay, fine. Okay, so we'll move on to some of the specific areas. So tariff classification is, um, I wouldn't necessarily say a particularly difficult area, but it's something that a lot of companies uh, won't necessarily have considered in any great depth in the past. So whenever you move goods uh, within an international standard called the harmonized system, each product will be given a tariff classification. It's a number sequence. And within the European Union for imports, it's 10 digits long. Uh, for export, it's slightly easier, it's eight. Uh, but the tariff classification uh, that you use out of Japan will largely mirror the tariff classification that you use for importing to the EU. Uh, what it is, it basically uh, drives the whole customs experience in terms of the import of goods. It drives the payment of taxes because the duty rate, um, anti-jumping duty if that exists, and other factors like excise duty, they will be applied to the tariff classification. And it also, certainly within the European Union, uh, determines other control measures. So, for instance, export licensing is tied to tariff classification as well. So the actual classifications you find, you, it starts from 0101. So that would be the first four digits, and that's called the heading. Uh, there's the four-digit heading. Then there it goes six digit subheading, eight digit sub subheading, and then there's a final sub subheading of 10 digits. But the very first classification is live horses, asses, mules, and hinnies. And something that customs always say is because it's the very first classification that's available, when um, exports or imports are made, quite often because it's a slip of the finger or whether it can't be bothered to look up the actual classification. 
Uh, this code is used far more often than it possibly should. There are more exports of live horses, apparently, than there are live horses in the UK, because it's, a, it's just seen as the first code. Um, but you get all sorts of um, sections. So the early sections deal with live animals, then you it goes through, I've got an example here of cane or beet sugar, you've got all the foodstuffs, and then eventually you get into raw materials, as uh, things like iron and steel, they fall into chapter 73. And then eventually you get into the more refined products, the electronic goods are in chapter 85, and then it goes all the way through to chapter 9706 antiques. It's a very, very extensive list, and it can be um, quite difficult to determine the correct code that would apply to a product, particularly if the product is relatively new, because these are historic um, codes. It takes a number of years for them to change. So for years, computers, for instance, were called automatic data processing machines rather than computers. It, um, but basically, uh, the, the book itself, if you were to look at it, it's the size of a telephone directory. Um, there are a number of rules that help you classify. In general, what you do is you look for the heading that applies for your products, and it is the narrative of that heading that you're looking for. So there are six rules for the classification of goods. If you look at the, the tariff, which is published online, and it's also published by the European Union, at the front of it, it states what the six rules of classification are. And predominantly, most goods are classified in relation to rule one and six. Rules two, three, four, and five are missed out for most goods. And basically, rule one says is you look for the heading that applies to your goods. And once you've applied, once you've found that heading, if there's no other heading that could apply to your goods, so for instance, if you've got a horse, it's going to go in 0101, there's nowhere else for it, that's where you belong. Then you would jump down to effectively avoid the rest and jump down to rule six, which said that extends the principles of rule one to the subheadings. And all that means is once you've found the four digit heading, rule six sends you down to look at the six and then the eight and then the 10. So as long as you only find one um, classification narrative that can apply to your product, you're home and dry. And that applies to almost, well, it applies to 90 plus percent of products. But you do, you do get occasions where that isn't the case. For instance, what if you're importing an in, incomplete item? Let's say you're importing a tractor and for ease of shipment, you've taken the cab off it and you've taken the wheels off it and you import that. How would you classify it? Well, rule two basically says that incomplete goods with the character of the finished goods are classified as if they're complete. So that's relatively straightforward. Rule three deals occasions where more than one classification code can apply. And it's a three stage approach. Uh, it says is one more specific than the others. It then says if it's um, composite goods or a mixture of goods, look at the item that gives the essential character to the supply. So that could be based on value. It could be based on mass or something like that. But you just, it's a matter of negotiation almost. Otherwise classification is according to the last in numerical order. So if there are two possible codes, you go for the last one. Um, rule four, I've never seen applied. Uh, and I've been doing classification for about 25 years classified according to the goods to which they are most akin. Very unlikely. And then rule five deals with packaging. If it's a violin imported in a violin case, the case is classified along with the violin. If the case is imported on its own, it's just a case. Um, there's a great deal about um, classification and it's something we'll probably be um, covering as a separate um, uh, webinar in the, in the future. Um, Couple of quick other points. So if you've got a multifunction product, something like an iPhone or a computer, it can do all sorts of, of things. So in this case, an iPhone is effectively a computer, a telephone, um, it's got Wi-Fi capability, it's a clock, a music player, you name it. Uh, and in those circumstances, classification is based on principal function. What was it made for? And in, in the case of phones, it's quite simple because they are classified as a uh, phone because that will always be their default. You might be playing a game, but it will default to the phone if it rings. Quick point on GR2, that was the one to do with incomplete items. So often parts have a lower duty rate than the finished item. And so there are instances where you might want to split a product to import it, to bring it back together again. And a very common case used to be with bicycles. Uh, bicycles 
from certain countries had anti-dumping duty on them, but their parts did not. And so to avoid the anti-dumping duty, the punitive rate of duty, the bikes, not quite like this, but the spokes um, and the wheel at the front would have been imported in one container and the, the back end of the bike in another container. You could never say that without the front and the back, you had a complete item. The problem was when, a, when com companies were doing this quite often, they might have shipped them in different containers, but they were arriving on the same ship. And if that's the case, then that counts as a single supply. So the declaration for, for that to work as a supply of split item, you'd even have to do it as different ships. So that's classification. It's a, as I say, it's a 10 digit code and you need to know what those classifications are for all the goods that you might be importing. Um, typically it's not uncommon for us to be help, uh, asked to help um, car manufacturers, people like that. And they may have 50, 100, 150, or even uh, 1,000, or even more uh, parts. You've got to know what they all are. <clears throat> then moving to the valuation of goods. So the three key pieces of information that you need to know when importing are, what's the classification? Because that's going to tell me the duty rate. What's the valuation? How much is that duty going to be uh, charged on and then finally we'll come on to origin because origin can reduce that duty rate. So valuation, in the same way as there are, are six rules for classification, there are six methods to value goods and again most of them fall under the first. So in most cases when goods are traded there is a transfer price, goods are bought and sold, there is the price paid for the goods when they are sent to in this case to the European Union. So the transaction price, the price paid or payable for the goods. So it could be that the goods are, uh, are sent to you and there's a price that's agreed of hundred pounds per item uh, based on an expected selling price. But later on, uh, if the selling price achieved is higher, it could well be that the supplier expects that additional funds to be sent to them. So it's the price paid or payable. If you imported at 100 and then in the end you paid 125, you have to go back to the original declaration and pay duty on the 125. Conversely, if the, there is a price reduction and that was foreseen at the time the goods were shipped, then again, you can go back and amend the declaration and get a, a, a duty refund. So the transaction value is for most goods, but if there is no transfer, if for instance, a company is transferring its own stock um, from the United States to a warehouse and it's not making sales uh, at the time of the sale, but from that stock once it's in place, then you can go for alternative methods and you go through them in sequence. So there's method two, the cost of identical goods. So if it happened to be that around the same time you had a supply of identical goods to somebody else within the European Union and there was a sale, uh, then you could base the value on that. Uh, if there wasn't that and there were similar goods, then you could look to base it on that. So the occasions where this happens is, for instance, a trawler will land a catch of prawns and half of that catch will have been sold to uh, a high street retailer, whereas the other half is going to market. In that case, you can value based on the effectively identical prawns, or at the very least, they would be regarded as sufficiently similar to declare them. But if you can't apply those because you don't have similar transactions occurring at the same time or roughly, you can go for four or five. At this point, you can interchange. So there's a deductive, which is you can make the sale in the European Union, you deduct elements such as the, the value of uh, the, the amount of duty that you would be paying um, and a notional cost for profit and other costs that took place there, storage within the European Union, something like that. Method five is a computed value based on the import value. So the cost of manufacture, the cost of shipping the goods here, an additional element of profit for the supplier. But in all instances, effectively, you're looking get, to get back to the one price. Whatever two, three, four, five, or six, which is a fallback, which is another means, and again, I've never seen that employed, um, you should be ending up effectively at what would have been the trans transaction price for goods. So under method one, there will be occasions where you have to alter the invoice price when you declare it to customs. 
So on a basic level, you have to pay for the cost of shipping, the freight costs to the European Union border. I mean, that will change to the UK border once we've left the European Union. But typically, the, the value for duty is the cost of the goods plus their, uh, their freight and insurance costs to the border. But there would be other things that you might have to include in that as well. For instance, if you're a clothing supplier and you're sending coat hangers and the tags that you might want to be included in the garment overseas to be used in manufacture, then you would do that. You would have to uplift the price to include those, those elements. Also, what's very common is that manufacturers will supply, uh, sorry, the, the customer will supply the manufacturing line to its, um, it, its supplier. And so the tools, molds, even the whole manufacturing line may have been supplied by them. You would have to apportion that and include that in the value of the goods that were subsequently imported. But then again, there are some deductions as well. And so if you were the importer of washing machines or tumble dryers that were catching fire, and you happen to have a warranty arrangement uh, with the original manufacturer whereby they were covering the costs of repair within the European Union or the cost of, uh, of refunds or, or, or warranty replacement, then the additional funds that you got back from the supplier, again, can be offset against the original duty payment and you can make a claim for that. There are also um, quality and quantity reductions so at some point you managed to have sold 10,000 items and under the agreement, the price drops. And not only does the price drop going forward, but the price has been retroactively uh, downgraded and you get a refund from your supplier. So you can go back and amend the customs declarations and get a refund. Again, only if that was envisaged at the time of shipment. There are, there are some other minor ones to, as well to do with exchange rates. Uh, transfer pricing adjustments and, and financing as well. So that's valuation. And then the third key thing is origin. So when you come to make a customs declaration, you have to say where the goods come from. And there are two types of origin. There is origin for non-preferential purposes, and then there is origin for preference under a free trade agreement. So origin for non-preferential purposes is just to say where the goods came from effectively. And that will be wherever the last substantial economic operation took place. So lots of simple things, sorting goods, changing the packaging, putting them in sets, so bringing together a hammer, chisels, putting them in a set, that wouldn't change the origin, putting labels on them. The, the very basic things won't change their origin. Basically, it's got to be in a process that adds value significantly, that it's an actual working uh, in a production line, for instance, equipped for that purpose, um, or something that brings about a new product. But that wouldn't affect the uh, ability to claim a reduced rate of duty under a free trade agreement. Rather there, there will be specific rules that govern whether you've uh, attained the origin for that particular country. And they will be laid out in the free trade agreement that exists between the parties. And so each free trade agreement will be different. The one that we might negotiate with the European Union, if that ever comes about, will no doubt be very different to the one that exists between us and the United States. But only originating goods can benefit from reduced rates of duty. So it's very common um, on the world um, scale for goods, for instance, to have been produced in one country to be diverted through a country that offers a preferential rate of origin and to be rebadged. So it is associated with a degree of fraud and therefore the authorities do police origin very carefully. So free circulation does not confer origin. So for instance, if uh, Chinese goods were entered in Japan and were duty paid in Japan, that doesn't mean they've become uh, Japanese origin. So the typical rules of origin are wholly produced, so something that was made there completely, uh, where there's been a change in eight-digit tariff classification. So if you go within a tariff chapter, uh, sorry, a tariff heading at the four-digit level, you'll have a number of subheadings, and commonly you'll have one that is parts, and it will be at the eight-digit level. So if you manufactured a, a mobile phone, for instance, all from mobile phone parts, 
then that will have changed eight digit tariff classification because a phone is different to its parts. There are also rules to do with added value. So the value of non-originating parts falls below a, a predetermined value. That's generally 40%. So it might be that in Japan, you've got a product being made uh, out of Chinese components, but they're uh, adding to the, uh, the value of the product by bringing those components together and then adding on a level of profit. As long as the value of the non-originating Chinese components is uh, below 40%, then that product has now become Japanese for preferential purposes as well as non-preferential. Just to quickly go through a few of those, so wholly produced, uh, these are most common in the agricultural food sector, so no other country is involved in their production. Uh, the smallest addition of material in processing um, in another country will disqualify the product. Uh, and so, for instance, if you've got wheat that is taken in bulk and then repackaged uh, and you're putting that in sacks or in, in boxes or whatever, then that will no longer be wholly produced. Um, so manufactured products very rarely meet this criteria unless you know for a fact that everything that's going in it has been sourced from that country. Uh, manufactured goods, this is where you tend to have the percentage rule most often. <clears throat> The percentage rule is based on the X works price of the finished product. So at the factory gate, so it doesn't include the, the, the value of shipping the goods to the European Union or anything like that. So it's what is the cost of manufacture and that includes the profit. And so that 40%, 50% or whatever the criteria is, uh, it, it's at the factory door. Um, and then you, Finally, you get quite often specified processes. These are very common in the clothing sector. So as an example, you quite commonly get this manufacture from yarn. And so it would be the case, for instance, if you had a jacket, that the material on the outside of that jacket would have had to, let's say it's coming from Italy in the future, and it wants to come to the UK under a free trade agreement. The material on the outside of the jacket that would have had to have been manufactured from yarn. The yarn could have come from India or China or anywhere else, but the cloth would have had to be woven in in Italy and then used in the manufacture of the jacket. But the same would also have to apply to the lining of that jacket. Uh, and if that weren't the case, then it wouldn't be able to, to claim preferential origin. So assuming that, that we do leave the European Union at the end of the year, it's important to know if you're in the clothing sector and you are buying from the continent, whether or not your suppliers can substantiate origin fully within their country. Now, there are no rules set between ourselves and the EU at the moment, but you can assume that the general rules will apply. And so in the clothing sector, it will be this. In the agricultural sector, wholly produced. Um, and then in electronics, things like the 40% rule will apply. So you can look to existing agreements. It doesn't guarantee that that's what you'll get. So those are the three key areas of duty. Um, some quick other items that might come up as a result of moving towards Brexit. So there are things called duty reliefs. Um, I briefly touched on them earlier. So for instance, if you're importing at the moment from the United States goods that you're going to repair and then return to the United States, you might want to employ in with processing. You basically bring the goods, you have to be pre-approved, but you bring the goods in duty free, and then you re-export them back to the United States. And if you can demonstrate that that's happened, you'll never be charged duty on them. So it requires approval from customs. You have to put a guarantee in place, security against the fact that the goods might not leave. To be fair, retrospection is generally possible. So if you don't do it at the time of the import, you can go backwards within a year and ask for approval. Um, but this is very heavily controlled by the authorities. And if you're going to use something like this, you have to make sure that you get everything right. So for instance, is the product that you import and export properly classified? Because if it's not and customs find that at a later date, they'll ask for the duty that you suspended at the time of import. Uh, have you got sufficient processing time? You'll be given time to actually carry out the repair. If you go over that, again, the duty becomes due. If you go over the number of items that you're allowed to import in a year, the quantity, again, you would be asked for the duty and you must make a return. You must tell customs what you've done. And again, if that's not submitted on time, they'll ask for the money. 
and records must be maintained. So inward processing has been used by the few while we've been in the European Union, but particularly in the food and the textile sector where duty is going to stick and be very high, this is going to be used heavily. For instance, there are a lot of um, processing plants in the Republic of Ireland that make pies, pizzas and all sorts of things for use in the UK. And raw material goes from the UK to, to, to be used in manufacturing. So there will be inward processing into Ireland and out again, but there will also be outward processing. So if you have a pie that is made in Ireland that's being manufactured from UK wheat, you would want to export that wheat under outward processing from the UK, create yourself a duty credit, and then when the goods are re-imported as a pie, you can offset that credit. So there are two ways of doing it. If the, if the duty is based on, on value, then it's a simple calculation. Effectively, you're paying duty on the uplift in value of the goods. Uh, if it's based on something like weight, then you're taking a percentage, again, based on value of the duty that would otherwise be paid. So inward processing coming into the, the, the territory, outward processing going out of the territory and then back again. And as I've just indicated, you can combine the two. So in that instance, you would get um, outward processing from the UK to Ireland and then inward into Ireland. Now, this type of thing has been happening quite a lot already, including countries like, uh, well, particularly in Switzerland. So there are highly dutiable commodities. I mentioned sugar earlier a lot earlier on, where you've got 419 euros per tonne. It's more than 100% the value of the sugar that you might buy. But obviously sugar is used to make things. So if you wanted to import Caribbean sugar and avoid paying the duty, what you could do is send it into Switzerland and turn it into something else. And so uh, you might, this is an actual example where I won't go into what was actually made, but it produced a product that was 10.2% dutiable. And then that product was re-imported into the EU and avoided the very hefty duty uh, at the outset. And in fact, it went further than that because Switzerland and the EU have a free trade agreement. Um, the goods actually came in duty free in the end because they had been, their origin had changed within Switzerland. They had changed eight digit classification and they now uh, qualified. And at the same time as you had uh, it, inward processing into Switzerland, you could also do the same thing. So you could have sent product out from the EU under outward processing into Switzerland and then back out again. So that kind of processing that has been carried out commonly in Switzerland, of course, once we leave the European Union, that could happen here. And so you could have French companies sending goods through the UK first and then imported into France once they've been processed. So finally, the question of, of Brexit. Um, here, what I'll do is I'll suggest that there are uh, a certain things that companies must do um, in preparation if you haven't already done so. So the first thing to bear in mind is there will be border controls. Declarations are a, a, a certainty. They're going to happen. They're probably going to happen on the 1st of January next year. And so you must be in a position to actually be able to make them. So you can either do it yourself. Uh, and as we've seen, there's quite a lot of information that you require to do that. Uh, you can set yourself up with a, uh, a software provider that would allow you to interact with customs entry processing system to make declarations. But generally what people do is they secure brokerage capacity. They find themselves a customs broker, an import export agent to act on their behalf. But please bear in mind that there is limited, limited capacity in the system and the storm that's probably going to break in the media once uh, we actually get past the end of June, and it turns out we probably are leaving the European Union, is the lack of brokerage capacity. So if you leave it too late, I would suggest if you're leaving it past July, you haven't got a signed agreement in principle with a broker, you may struggle to find one. Now that's going to be particularly true on the continent if you're looking for somebody to represent you on an indirect basis, because they will have to go through jumps and hoops within their systems to be able to take on clients on an indirect basis. Uh, and there will be a limited number that are prepared to do it. So secure brokerage capacity here and on the continent. Uh, consider the terms of trade that you operate between you and your suppliers. 
Commonly, the terms of trade within the European Union are different to world trade terms, and they have a big hit on VAT implications. So again, I think we're, once the, the, the Brexit um, agreement is, is in place, or we know there won't be one, we'll probably do one specifically on VAT, but there's a lot around that. Um, and then companies that have never looked at the classification of their goods, they may have done for in, uh, interest at purposes, you should look at it better now because tax uh, will apply to it and the authorities will be much keener to look at them. Rules of origin, maybe that's a big deal for you, particularly if you're on textiles, foods, where duty is going to be high and stick. It may be you want to have a word with your suppliers or you may want to look at who supplies you with parts to ensure that you can say, this is UK goods or the, the goods that are, are coming in from the continent are EU goods. Um, and then, if necessary, plan to use inward and outward processing, potentially even customs warehousing, other factors as well. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, for your time. I think there's uh, probably some questions coming our way. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, before we go into the questions, I'll just do one last poll. And this one is asking about the main impact of COVID-19 on your business so far. Um, the options there include decline in demand for our services, staff off sick, uh, cash flow issues, rise in price of freight transports, or delays at customs. Um, while letting people answer that question, a question, Steve, um, in terms of um, getting more information about how to prepare for Brexit, could you say a little bit more about the qualifications offered by the Customs Academy and maybe touch upon the grant scheme as well, which is out there for people to use? Yes, certainly. So um, as we, or as Will alluded to at the beginning of um, today's presentation, the Academy was requested by UK government. So as Brexit approached, it could see that there was a shortfall of knowledge within industry. So if I turn back the clock a good few years when I was a customs officer, uh, I would go into companies and most of them would have somebody whose day-to-day -day job was dealing with customs formalities. But over time that has waned. And now that we're leaving the European Union and declarations are going to become a matter of course, clearly you need to know what you're doing. And so the academy has been set up uh, at the behest of the authorities to allow people to pick up that the knowledge that they require. Not only the brokers that will make declarations because there's probably going to have to be another uh, 50,000 of those. I think currently there's about 40. So it's virtually going to, well, more than double the number. But people in companies, of course, will need to know, well, if I'm asked for my tariff classification or the value of my goods, what will that be? And so the academy was set up with that in mind. So the, the qualifications that it offers are on a tiered basis. So the level two is the basic qualification, and that teaches you on a need to know basis effectively what the basics are if I'm going to interact with an agent. The level uh, three qualification, for instance, is aimed at agents so that they can understand how to complete a customs declaration. But it's also aimed at people within companies who will need to classify goods, who will need to set policy with determining the value of goods. And uh, customs increasingly will require companies to demonstrate that they know what they're doing in the customs world. They will give them carte blanche to do things like, avoid making full customs declarations at the point of import and make summary monthly declarations. But to be able to do that, you will have to demonstrate that people within that company are competent to be able to do that. And therefore they will have to have a qualification in it. And so the, uh, the tiered courses that the academy offers are very much aimed at that. Once you get beyond level four into five, it, it becomes more for people within companies who might set policy to do with classification and, 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 and things like that. But th th that's the principal point of it. It's here for Brexit and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And uh, loads of questions coming in. And um, just before I do that, just to hear the poll results, 55% uh, say it's decline in demand for our services has been the main impact, 21% rise in price of freight transport. Um, that actually tallies quite nicely with the other polls we've done on the same question. Um, so very interesting there indeed. So we're getting loads of questions through and we won't be able to get to all of them today, but I'll try the best I can. Um, one 
which came in from Ryan. He's asked, um, with the Northern Ireland Protocol, will documents be needed between Northern Ireland and Great Britain? Okay, so um, goods that are your standard goods that are being shipped to Ireland. <clears throat> All this goes on a uh, proposal come out from UK government, so it's not set in stone, it's not agreed with the EU. But in general, goods that leave here for Northern Ireland that are known to be going there, there won't be a requirement for a customs declaration or anything like that. The exception to that is agricultural goods. At the moment, there is a need for uh, um, phytosanitary certificates and things like that because the island of Ireland is treated as a separate zone anyway. So that would continue. Um, if you're exporting goods from the UK into the Republic of Ireland, yes, you will need an export declaration and almost certainly you'll need an import, well, you will need an import declaration into Ireland as well. Coming back the other way, goods leaving Northern Ireland for the UK, uh, that won't be an issue at all. Uh, leaving Ireland for the nor uh, for Northern Ireland, again, you would need an export declaration for that. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. A uh, question we've had in from Sabir. He's asked, will binding origin information still exist post-transitional period? Can we rely on existing BOI where the three-year three has not expired post-transitional period? Okay, so binding tariff information and binding origin information. If you want the authorities to say this specifically is the classification of your goods or yes, we agree that your goods are of UK or EU origin, um, uh, you can apply to the authorities for that. With regard to tariff, they probably will continue. With regard to binding origin, there's a real question on that because origin can be dependent on goods that have been supplied from Germany, China, uh, Germany, uh, France, Spain, other member states. So it could impact on it because if those countries, we're obviously not part of that block anymore, if those parts have gone into it, that could affect origin. Um, so at the moment, no, I suspect that might not be the case, I'm afraid. Thank you, thank you, Steve. A question in from Zanita is asked, are outward processing or inward processing relief serial number specific or are they commodity code based? Uh, the commodity code based. So, um, and it's at the eight digit level. So as long as the goods um, exist within that, you should be fine. A question from Sue who's asked, do you know if interest stats will still be required after Jan 21? HMRC has previously said, previously said yes when TSP was in place? Okay, so that's one of the, the biggest questions and unanswered questions at the moment. So for those who aren't aware, TSP was Transitional Simplified Procedures. So this was an import mechanism to allow goods into the UK effectively without a declaration or a very minimal declaration at the border. Now, in particular, across the Straits of Dover. At the moment, the government is supposed to be making uh, uh, an arrangement that it, is there to replace TSP, something a little more uh, significant. So maybe an initial message that goods are coming in at the border, very simplified, we've got some goods effectively and we are uh, this company with this authorization number um, and then make a, a declaration later on. Um, under, uh, under TSP, um, that was effectively the only option that was open to customs at the time because they had no ability to bring in bringing controls at the border. And it's almost certain that there is insufficient time between now and the end of the year for something markedly different. And so I would imagine that something similar to TSP will exist. So can you remind me of the question? Did that answer it? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, I think so. Um, yeah, it does, I think. Um, okay, so moving on, a question from Judith and also Adriana, basically asking around who's going to be able to complete customs declarations. Judith asks, do couriers such as TNT and DHL qualify as customs brokers? Adriana says uh, she was under the impression that freight forwarders would be in a position to complete customs declarations. Okay, so in effect, anybody can uh, complete a customs declaration. There is no requirement to be a licensed customs broker in this country. That may well change after Brexit, but it's certainly isn't the case now. So I could go walk out the door, pick somebody off the street, 
and put them behind a desk and say, here you are, this is a customs entry system, away you go. And they could start making declarations into the system. Um, there's a little more to it than that. Obviously, there are uh, licensing that you would need to have in place to be able to, to make those declarations with software providers, that kind of thing. But effectively, a company can choose to make declarations on its own accord. Um, you can go to the likes of TNT, DHL, the big shippers, uh, and ask them to make declarations on your behalf. Equally, you can go to independent brokers, KGH, who I work for, for instance, is one, uh, uh, George uh, um, Baker and all sorts of other uh, big players in the market, you could go to them. But as I said at the outset, uh, or rather, as I said on the Brexit side, brokerage capacity is quite limited. And a lot of existing brokers are saying, we have our client base, their volume of declarations is going to go up. So we're expanding our capacity to take on their additional capacity. And so though people are taking on new customers, that um, that is becoming an ever dwindling resource. And unless more and more uh, brokers are trained, and that is the idea partly behind the academy um, and other measures that the government's, I think, going to announce soon, um, th there isn't a great deal of capacity in the system. So get out there now and find it, I would suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, a question in from Praveen Kumar, who's asked, would long-term supply declarations issued before Brexit still be valid after Brexit? And by Brexit, I take it means end of transition period. Uh, if the supplier is outside the European Union and it's to do with the supply under a free trade agreement, then assuming that free trade agreement is mirrored by the, the UK to the existing one with the EU, then I would suggest, yes, it probably is. If it's a supplier's declaration to do with origin for goods leaving the UK, again, I would suggest they probably have to be revisited because the rules have changed. Countries like France, there's a thing called cumulation where all the member states, the originating goods can be lumped together as if they came from the UK, but really some of it came from France or Germany. Those rules will have gone almost certainly, and therefore you would probably have to revisit supplier declarations within the UK. Thanks, Steve. I'll do a couple more questions because we're starting to run low on time. A question okay. in from Linda who's asked, do you have any idea of when CDS will become live, the Customs Declaration System? And can you explain a little bit about what that will be? Um, I, I, all I would suggest is it's a, a, an ever disappearing target over the horizon. I don't know um, how and when customs will finally get it in place. That's about all I can say. It's, um, it's had a, a pretty uh, turbulent time thus far and nobody within customs is saying, yes, we've got it right, it's going to be implemented. So um, I think we're sticking with Chief for the foreseeable future. Thanks, Steve. And one last question. Uh, I can't remember who asked it, but it's about AEO. And it's just basically asking, could you explain a bit more about what AEO is and kind of how it could be used um, in the next few years? Would you recommend okay. gaining it? It's from Judith. Sure. I mean, AEO um, is um, Authorised Economic Operator. It's basically an uh, approval um, given by customs once you demonstrate that your systems are, are sufficiently robust to make sure effectively you're not doing anything incorrect within the customs world. Um, historically, it's had very few benefits that go along with it. Uh, the government is going to remodel it and call it a trusted trader program. And under that arrangement, people will actually get definitive benefits. So if you become a trusted trader, which is an approval process, um, you will have preferential um, clearance of goods. So for instance, at the Straits of Dover, your vehicles are less likely to be stopped. Um, and you also you will get things like, if you decide I need inward processing, rather than to go through an approval process, which can take months, uh, the likelihood is you would be effectively pre-approved for inward processing. Uh, you would just have to notify customs that you decided to start using it, that kind of thing. So it, it, it's not been worth a great deal in the past. It's going to be worth a great deal more. Certainly, that's the intention in the future. Thanks, Steve. Um, we've had absolutely loads of questions coming, still coming in, um, but we won't be able to get to all of them today. Um, as mentioned earlier, you can get in contact with us um, at the info at ukcustomsacademy.co.uk email, and we'll try our best to um, 
to to help with those and obviously our qualifications do help answer some of these questions as well so um we'll be sending the the details of all that shortly but for now many thanks to steve i hope everyone has found that presentation and those answers useful um and uh yeah in the last slide you should be able to see the contact details which i will leave there for a few seconds before ending the call but um yeah please do get in touch if you have any questions and please do stay safe and um hope to hear from you soon <laughs>